Good morning and welcome to the implementation of the Beneficial Ownership Heartstop webinar. This morning, the CIPC and Intellectual Properties Commission will, as of the 11th December 2023, incorporate additions to the annual returns filings for companies and closed corporation. These are beneficial ownership filings and turnover validation. I now hand you over to advocate Krista Cloco to explain these additions in more detail. Advocate Cloco. Good morning, everybody. Once again, thank you, Shawnee. Um, and welcome to all our customers. Thank you very much for attending this. Um, I just want to express my appreciation for it. I know it's been, it's the end of the year. There's been a lot of changes, not just in the CIPC side, but also in the economy. And I would just like to thank you for making the time to actually attend and, and, and see what these changes are in order to prepare yourself for what is coming. So thank you very much. So as Shani indicated, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the inclusions into the annual return system. We're not going to talk about annual returns and the law and the regulations surrounding annual returns or go into detail as to beneficial ownership and the legal uh, and the legal obligations surrounding it. We just both the, the, the scope is to actually indicate and prepare you as to how this changes is going to look like on annual returns in order to prepare yourself in order for you to assist you and to, to comply and also to get your client base to comply. So I would just like to request that we keep to the scope of it. And then when we get to the beneficial ownership component, um, the, the registry side, how the service actually looks, I'm going to hand over to uh, Lucinda Stienka. She's our senior legal advisor and the senior manager responsible for managing the registry for beneficial ownership. So halfway through the presentation, I am going to hand over to, to Lucinda. And once she is done, I'm going to, um, I'm going to continue with the rest of the part of the presentation. So that being said, let's start. Just a brief reminder of what is annual returns. Um, I think if you're a regular customer of CIPC and an intermediary, you know this off by heart already. So annual returns in a very simplified way of saying is your annual renewal of your business to conduct business in the South African economy, right? That's not a legal description. It's an annual filing, meaning once a year, of information. Annual returns is a service in terms of which CIPC actually collects information upon our registry that is used to execute our various function objectives and to assist the business environment, the banks, other regulators, as well as other government institutions in decision making. So as you may know, during the annual return filing, the information that we check for is corporate information. That's, for example, directors, auditors, address, financial year end and company name, whether that is up to date. We check for th that the financial record keeping occurred and um, via the AFS or FIS. For those that are new, AFS is the, your annual financial statements. And then the FIS is basically your supplement, basically saying who did what when it came to the accounting and record keep, financial record keeping of your business. We also check the level of compliance with the Companies Act via the compliance checklist. We're now going to who is the beneficial owners. We're going to try to make it as easy as possible to comply during the annual return. Once again, the objective is an annual filing of information, an annual collection of all the information regarding the company. Not that you have little bits and pieces all over during a year. Then we're also going to check uh, we check operational information, that's the number of employees, active or dormant, main business activity, and where the business is conducting business. Just a note on this last one, this information is currently collected on the BIS portal only. We are in the process of planning to upgrade all the annual returns as um, uh, filing services via the different platforms, e-services, SSDs, um, and mobile app to also collect that information. All right, and again, we collect all of this information to meet our various functions and objectives as the CIPC. 
as indicated in the intro, the purpose is not to go into annual returns into debts. Uh, how does the registration work and all those type of things. If you are not familiar with annual returns or you want to refresh your memory and knowledge about annual returns, please go to the link here. We recently did a number of webinars on annual returns and it's all posted on our YouTube channel. You can engage from there um, in order to find out more. All right, so as Shani said, um, we're going to make we're going to introduce two changes into annual returns. The one is a link up with beneficial ownership declaration. Um, and then also we're going to validate turnover with the information filed on the IX barrel. Very, very important that we are going to start this on e-services. As, so as from the 11th of December 2023, it's on e-services only that this has been brought in. It does not negate or absolve the fact that you, if you filed your annual returns via any of the other platforms, that you don't have to file the beneficial ownership. You still have to comply with that as well. Now you ask, what about the other channels? So as from uh, January, February, March, we're still planning on how, when and how this is going to be done. We will be introducing these changes into the other platforms, SSDs, mobile app, and this portal themselves. With the end goal, very, very important, please mark it in red if you're an intermediary that does the services on behalf of your clients, mark it in red. From the 1st of April 2024, it will be mandatory to have your BO filed and submitted before you'll be able to file annual returns. But for now, please, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm going to sound a little bit, um, just excuse it, for now, you will get a message on annual returns about beneficial ownership that you can skip or ignore or to file. Again, if you choose to ignore, you're still obliged to file the beneficial ownership information as quickly as possible in order to become legal compliant. So it is almost like a reminder, a soft stop um, currently on e-services. As from 1 April 2024, it will be what we call in CFC a hard stop, meaning if you are not up to date, it's not filed, you will not be able to reach the rest of the parts of annual returns. And if you don't file, you're going to start sitting with challenges on annual returns. All right. Um, sorry that I sound very harsh on the, <laughs> on, the, on the changes of beneficial ownership. It is a reality and it's a very important element for South Africa to have this information. So we are trying to emphasize the importance of beneficial ownership and declaring that information as part of your filing cycles. All right, again, beneficial ownership. This is not a full webinar on beneficial ownership. It's very high level. Please, if you're not familiar with beneficial ownership, we still have some questions. Please refer back to the webinars. I think there's two or three on our YouTube channel that you can go through and check it out. And the nice thing about the YouTube channel and the videos is you can listen up to a point, pause, think about it, apply your mind, and then move forward. You can do it at your own time. All right, so please go through that. But very, very short and sweet. Um, Unfortunately, I'm going to be honest, it's not sweet. Um, I know we're all struggling in South Africa in trying to, to keep up with all the changes in our economy and things that we are expected to do and the things that we are going through as South Africans is that it is going to be uncomfortable until you've done it once or twice. And then, especially if you're an intermediary, it will start becoming easier as we always strive with the CIP and at the CIP, we're trying to make it as easy as possible, trying to take the law and simplify it onto online platforms in order to make it easier. Sometimes it's, it's successful, other times it is not, uh, but it's something that we all are going to get used to as we start entrenching beneficial ownership and declaration of that type of information within the economy. Just also be reminded, it's not just a CIPC thing. Such also is collecting beneficial ownership information. The master of the high court is doing it. We, um, 
as an economy, a lot of regulators are starting to build up a register of beneficial ownership information. So this is not just a CIPC thing. So know those that are not familiar what beneficial ownership is, very short and sweet, what is beneficial ownership? It is basically the determination of who is the natural person, the breathing person, who directly or indirectly, through various means, directs, influence, or controls the affairs of the company, external company, or close corporation. That person's name may not necessarily be on the registers that, or the documentation that is kept by the company, but ultimately down various layers, this is the person that tells the company how to make its decision and controls how this company works and actually deals with its administration and its business activities in the real world. It's the person, I like to say, it is, it's who wags the, the dog. Okay. Again, this is not a legal definition. The definition is quite complex, so please refer to the webinar to go through the different checks. If you follow the way that it's structured on the webinar, you can actually do it like a yes-no type of uh, approach to say, first up, first thing that needs to be uh, measured, yes, no, okay, move to the next, and then you'll get through it. So what is the object of, be of beneficial ownership? Why is this all of a sudden here? So we need to have a register of natural persons who exercise control over legal, legal entities. So CIPC, as you all know, we are the regulator and the custodian of the registries regarding companies, close corporations, and cooperatives. So naturally, that's part of the information that we need to keep. This will also bring South Africa in line with international best practices. Please, I can't stress it enough. This is not a CIPC thing. It is not a South African thing. This is an international best practice. Most economies have beneficial ownership information or have requirements that it needs to be complied with and disclosed. Different jurisdictions deals with it slightly different. Some jurisdictions, it is closed information, meaning you submit it. It's not available to the general public. Uh, we're still in transition of hours. We are going to be, have an open transparency about this because our company's act is open and transparent. So this is best international best practice. If South Africa wants to compete on the international scale and make our businesses viable and create and set our economy up as an investment destination, we need to have this. So it's very, very, very important. The other benefit that it has is this assists law enforcement and their investigations to say who is ultimately the decision maker on the company's actions. We all know company's actions can have detrimental effects. Um, to be quite honest, state capture is a, an example that pops up to mind. But who at the ultimate end directed the, the administration of these companies. We need to know in order to hold them accountable, and therefore we need that information. Okay. Right, so this has got the following benefits. I've already touched on it, so I'm just going to read it. Um, it has numerous benefits for our economy in knowing who owns whom and will make our economy investor-friendly and the cost of capital to be reasonable. So let's say, for example, what we mean by cost of capital. So if they want to invest in South Africa and, the, and this company will have to not just put the down the investment cost, but need to incur additional cost to actually figure out who is going to control and who's going to influence this agreement that they have, that increases the cost of investing in South Africa. Then also, we need to make sure in order to be investment friendly, we need to make sure that our business environment is regulated. If companies and people involved in companies are not held accountable uh, for their actions, uh, the enforcement of those actions, then we diminish our investment. Um, um, it's going to cost those companies more than to invest if something goes wrong. So we need that information. All right, I'm just going to take a deep breath for now before we actually go into the more practicalities regarding 
filing of the beneficial ownership declaration. So the next thing we've now discussed what this basically is and the big why. Now it, it's to how do you prepare what you need to submit beneficial ownership information or declaration. Um, my apologies if I say, for example, BO, uh, if I use the abbreviation of BO, I mean beneficial ownership. Um, in CIPC, we've got so many terminologies that we tend to do abbreviations. So if it does slip in, slip in, benef BO refers to beneficial ownership. Okay. So there's a couple of documents that you are going to need. Again, please refer to the webinar as well and as well as the user guide on beneficial ownership. The user guide is basically your step-by-step -step guide on how to get this done for more detail as for these elements. So you need a member or a securities register. You need the beneficial interest register, if that is applicable, certified ID copy or passport copy of the person that's going to submit the information, and then certified ID copy or passport of all the beneficial ownership, the, the actual information of that national person that you are going to submit, and you need a mandate, a written document, uh, document to say that you are authorized by the company to submit this information on the CIPC registry. All right, so mandate. So we need to confirm that the person submitting the BO, the beneficial ownership information, was mandated by the company, external company or close corporation in writing to do so. It is very, very important. Because of the, the value of this information, we need to make sure that everything is accounted for to, to, to protect the integrity and the value of the information. There's no specific template for a mandate, right? But there is some minimum information that it must contain, and we're quickly going to go through that. Again, this is all on the user guide if you want more information. So the content of the mandate, it may be in the form of a letter. If it's a letter, it must please be on the letterhead of the company or close corporation. It may be a resolution or a power of attorney. It must indicate the natural person, full name, surname, and identity number, who must submit the declaration or the information to the CIPC. So let's say, for example, um, company ABC mandates me, Krista Cloco. So I need a written document from the company that states my name, my surname, and my identity number that I may file. Now, the next thing that this document must, com uh, must comply with, it must clearly state the extent of the mandate. Please don't write blanket mandate. Krista Clarka can submit anything with a CIPC. Uh, that's very wide. There's lots of obligations in terms of the Companies Act. So it must be very specific. It needs to state, specifically state, above file all other information with the CIPC, it must specifically state, must submit beneficial information ownership information with a CIPC and for what period. You cannot have a mandate that's five years old. It must be relevant to the filing for which needs to be submitted. Then the next one is the natural person, Krista Cloco. I must have a valid customer code with a CIPC. So you've mandated me and my customer code. If I sometimes use a customer code, which we actually don't encourage in CIPC, of a colleague in the same office as mine, I will not be able to use, when I actually file the information, to be used the other colleague's customer code. The natural person with his or her customer code must then submit. If there is a difference and for some reason there's a change in customer code, unfortunately your documentation needs to be changed in order to mandate and align to all this information. Again, the mandate must be accompanied by a certified ID copy of the filer, which is, in this case, mine. And then who must sign this mandate? Very, very important. It must be signed. It's 50% plus one of the directors of the company. So if there is five directors, active directors, two of them must sign to meet the 50% plus one, so it's three out of five that has to has to sign this document, OK? 
Okay. And then for CCs, it's all the members of the CC. Then the securities or members register, um, to be quite honest, not a lot of companies small, uh, or smaller companies are actually keeping security and member registers. You're encouraged to do so. It's a legal requirement to keep your company document. It's one of your mandatory documents that you have to keep. So in terms of Section 50 of the Companies Act, every company, an external company, must keep a securities register at all times of issued securities, which may include beneficial interest information. If it is a closed corporation, it is a member's register indicating the members' names of the CC and their percentage. Now the question arises, what about NPCs? Because we've got NPCs with members and NPCs without members. So NPCs without members, submission of director's register and beneficial ownership information. Because an NPC does not have members, who else then needs to stand in? It will then be the director's register. Who's the director's? And then the beneficial ownership information. In the case where the NPC does have members, right? You get NPCs that has got members that assist in, dif in different types of decision making. Then we need to have the members register, the register of all the NPC members. All right, so that's just an introduction to the mandatory documents that you need to get ready. So the other practical questions, how is this going to look like? Okay, so those that are familiar, you will log in with your annual returns, you'll do the search on the enterprise, and then you get to the calculator part of where the system will reflect what annual returns has been paid, which ones are outstanding, and then you can type in the turnover in the little blocks, and you'll say calculate outstanding amount, right? So it will it will then create, say, how much the, the filing of the annual returns is going to cost. At this point in time, at this screen, the system will also check for beneficial ownership, whether your beneficial ownership is up to date, and it will actually give you a message to say, I'm going to read it, filing of beneficial ownership, Ownership declaration is compulsory for all companies and close corporations. Failure to adhere to the requirement may result in administrative sanctions and enforcement. If you wish to proceed with beneficial ownership filing, click next. If you want to file at a later stage, click ignore. So there you can make the decision. Please note, if you don't opt to file here, you're still legally obliged to file your beneficial ownership information. Just because you are not forced yet does not mean you're excused from this legal obligation. If you don't file your beneficial ownership with your annual returns or shortly hereafter or haven't filed it yet, we can investigate the company for non-compliance and take administrative sanctions against the company in order to comply. So this is basically how it's going to look like. So let's say you choose to go and we implore and, and request that you actually do. Click on next. You'll go into the end. Uh, you will be redirected to beneficial ownership and comply. So follow the instructions there. Once you're done with the beneficial ownership filing or the information, unfortunately, there's not an auto redirect back into annual returns. So unfortunately, once that is done, you will have to go back out and go back into the annual returns where you started and then continue the process forward. All right, so that is up to now. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Lucinda Stienkamp, to quickly take you through the screens of how the beneficial ownership register actually looks like. Again, this is just a high-level indication of what to expect. It is not the detail of beneficial ownership. Thank you very much, Lucinda. Thanks very much, Krista. Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> Krista, if you will just uh, proceed in scrolling for me, since you are sharing anyway. Um, I'm just going to take you quickly through the requirements of the Beneficial Ownership Register, just so that you know what it entails, where you need to click what. But please, as Krista indicated, it's very important to go through the user guide on the CIPC website that's published, it gives you a step-by-step -step guide of what the register looks like. And it also gives you 
an indication of the legislative requirements, why the CIPC is requesting this information and um, how it's going to be utilized. Okay, so once you've accessed your um, beneficial ownership register through the e-services portal, I think there's a slide of Chris's presentation a bit later on that shows you exactly where to find the beneficial ownership portal. You will get the declaration that indicates you as the filer declaring that you are authorized to file the beneficial ownership information on behalf of the company or closed corporation that is submitting. And it is important for you to understand that uh, providing false information, false statements, reckless conduct and non-compliance with the Act may result in criminal action against the person declaring, against the filer. So you must be very sure that you are mandated in order for to file on behalf of an entity. Once you have clicked on agree, in terms of the statement on the declaration, you can proceed. Okay, so there it will, the system will provide you with uh, a list of entities that are attached to that customer code. So you can go and select a specific entity that you are mandated to file beneficial ownership for, or you can search a new entity uh, to submit beneficial ownership declarations for. Once that has been done, you can proceed. Crystal? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next page will give you then the list of entities. You need to select whatever is applicable to the ones that you want to file for. Um and complete the beneficial ownership information. Let's see. I'm using my user guide in, in the on the left hand side here as well, just to guide you through. Okay, Krista, I think you can proceed. Okay, so this is the important part. Um, I've seen quite a few queries um, in the comments section with regards to uh, external companies and um, listed companies and their beneficial ownership filing declaration. The CIPC has made provision in the beneficial ownership register for three categories of companies that can be selected from. So the one will be an affected company. There is in the user guide a detail with regards to what is regarded as an affected company. That includes your public listed companies. It includes your state-owned companies and it includes certain private companies. So go and have a look at that. The other cat category will be non-affected companies with no beneficial ownership to declare. Um, where you, for example, have an entity that is a sole the sole director, sole shareholder, there's no uh, agreements in place that gives any additional person power over this company or significant control, Then, and there's really no beneficial ownership applicable, then that is the category that will be selected. And then the last one is the non-affected company, which is the most general one, non-affected company with beneficial ownership. Once you've selected your specific category, then it makes the filing of the rest of the information easy. Thanks, Krista. Okay, so after you have selected your uh, specific category of uh, company, that the, it will depend on the category, will depend what type of information you need to submit. If there is a selection of an affected company, you must still submit uh, or, or upload the mandate. It's mandatory for all filings. You must upload the certified ID copy of the uh, filer and you must also upload the securities or beneficial interest register even if affected company was selected. The regulations is very clear and the user guide as well on what is regarded as your beneficial interest register, what is regarded as your securities register, as mentioned by Krista earlier in the presentation as well, and the information that must be submitted. If there is no beneficial ownership information to declare, non-affected company with no beneficial ownership information, then you still need to upload your mandate, your certified ID of the filer and securities register. That is mandatory documents. Once you have uploaded all the necessary information, you can uh, submit, uh, proceed to the um, OTP page. 
all that uh, uploaded documents, yes, then you will receive the page where there's uh, OTP confirmations. You will click on the red cross, which will then validate the um, ID of the filer. This is very important. I know as well that there's been a lot of issues with regards to the ID verification. I need to reiterate as well that we have a direct link with the Department of Home Affairs. If there's any problem with the validation of the ID, that is based on the information that we receive from the Department of Home Affairs. If there's, for example, an issue related to the issue date, that the system indicates that it's not the latest um, ID, that there's another issue date, then this needs to be sorted out with Department of Home Affairs because we are extracting the data directly from Department of Home Affairs. They are informing in terms of uh, validation and it's not a CIPC error. It's nothing that we can do about it in that regard. Once you have done your validations and received your OTP, again, only the filer will receive the OTP via SMS and email, no longer the directors because of the cumbersome process of that. So the filer takes full responsibility for the information being submitted. That is why the mandate is so very important. Once the OTP confirmations has been confirmed, you will have your green crosses reflected there on the right-hand side, and you can uh, finish the process, which will then take you to the page to download the certificate. Just before Krista continues, I just need to indicate very importantly, if only if there is beneficial ownership information declared will you receive a beneficial ownership certificate. If a category of affected company or non-affected company with no beneficial ownership information was selected, you will not receive a beneficial ownership certificate, nor will you be able to download such a certificate and will only receive notification that the beneficial ownership information was filed. Beneficial ownership certificate is only applicable to beneficial ownership information declaration. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Krista. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lucinda. Much appreciated. Um, so let's quickly run through. Um, again, we're going to just going to high level touch base on a few other things before we get to the XBRL validation. I think that is a very short one. There's like two things to say there but let's quickly run through it. So again, as I said, once you have filed your beneficial ownership information, unfortunately, the system don't automatically reroute to you, so you'll have to go back in to file the annual return. So it's, this is very important. If you file, because you are the director of the, your, your own company, you don't use the service of intermediary. If you file your information via the BIS portal, you need to still go to e-services to comply with your beneficial ownership. As stated, over time, over the next couple of months, uh, uh, January, February, March, we'll start including it into the other platforms. So, unfortunately, we'll have to go back and stop to start the annual return. All right. So, if you opt to, you want to, you prefer rather, you'll file the beneficial ownership beforehand, or you don't have everything ready and uh, you filed your annual return and you need to come back to this, you go back to e-services on your dashboard at the bottom is beneficial ownership. You'll click there and it will open up the portal for you to comply with the beneficial ownership information. All right, so that is beneficial ownership. Let's quickly run through to next to the turnover validation. All right, on the same page where you calculate your AR and where uh, you're reminded about the beneficial ownership information, when you say calculate outstanding amount, and you have filed, the system will go and check whether this company or, or closed corporation actually filed via the IXPRL, the, the, uh, the audited financials. If they have done so, the system will then validate, validate against the revenue value that was submitted on that system. So you will not be able to proceed with the annual return filing if these two, the turnover and the revenue on IXPRL, does not correspond. So, very important to note that IXPRL captures decimals. Uh, it's 10 billion, blah, 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 comma, full stop, 28 cents, for example. The annual return system does not make provision for decimals. So, so what you need to do is 
you will use the turn the, the revenue amount on IX Brow and drop. Ignore any values pass after the decimal point. Please don't round it up or down. Just drop the decimal uh, values. It is just easier for us. We've realized over time, it's just the easiest way to actually to get this type of um, validations done. So if you if you only filed an FAS, there will be, of course, no validation because FAS is basically just who did what regarding the financial and accounting record keeping. It's not the detailed financials of the company or close corporation. If FAS were filed, my apologies, that should have been... Uh, sorry, it, that, that's an uh, error on my side. If an AFS were filed, not FAS, ensure that the correct turn of a value on annual returns reflect. All right. So this is going to limit unnecessary requests for debit and credit notes. Please note that we get unnecessary requests for credit and debit notes on annual returns. We are going to start looking at it. It's becoming a concern for us that co companies are not filing their correct turnovers via annual return and think they can just give us the, sub the financials afterwards, say, oops, I made a mistake. I got confused between the group of companies. Uh, please correct the turnover value uh, by crediting or debiting our customer code. It's a tedious process. It is a tedious, tedious process and actually unnecessary. So when you submit annual returns, please double check that you submit the correct turnover for the correct company onto the system. Also be reminded that if you have made a mistake and you did not come forward to declare that that mistake was made, criminal offense, it's a criminal offense to lie or submit false information to the CIPC. It's not an administrative error or uh, issue it is a criminal offence to submit false information to the CIPC. So please double check that the turnover values that you submit are the correct ones for the correct companies. All right, so that's just the check. So why is compliance important? Um, I've added this into the presentation because it's very important to note that there are consequences for non-compliance. So... But you have to understand why there's compliance uh, or uh, consequences. In order to do that, we first need to start. Why is it important that we get the correct information in the first place? So as you know, CRPC is the custodian for all registered company, corporate entities in South Africa. We are the source registry for that information. There's no one else in the economy that's mandated to keep that information. Public and government institutions uses the CIPC information to make decisions. Um, I'm not going to go through there. So it's critical for the CIPC to be up to date. It's also very important for you as a business to make sure because you expect that somebody that you do business with are compliant with the law because it helps with your risks, helps you with your decision making. Is this a good candidate or a partner to go into business with or a good service provider? Whatever the service may be, you will come and check against our registry to see, number one, that you're doing business with the, with the people that say they, who they are and also to help you to mitigate your information risk surrounding it. Now, therefore, there's a duty on you yourself to provide the correct information to, to the CIPC because that company doing business with you or a foreign company wants to do business with you in South Africa or you want to do business with a foreign company overseas, they are going to check this information and make sure that everything is aligned. So that's just the short and sweet of it. and um, You can read that over there as well. Okay, so I've already touched base on this. There's just a few examples of how our information actually are used by other private and government institutions. Our information is usually um, consolidated with other information sources in the economy to get a bigger picture of things that are going forward. Uh, the CIPC information or the information that we keep is also used during civil and criminal investigations. And we even take 
as the CIPC will take our own data to take companies to court for non-compliance with the Companies Act and director's misconduct. So, so that is the importance of why that information is important. We have discussed or indicated why beneficial ownership information in the South African context is so critical that we have it. So now the consequence of non-compliance with annual returns. So those that are not familiar with it, if you have not filed for two successive years, your annual returns, you can still file, but we'll place you into the deregistration process, which is basically a risk indicator for other companies doing business with you. So listen, hold on, this company may be ending its life cycle. So why do you want to go in a contract, a five-year agreement with this company? If it's probably going to be, be deceased or the legal uh, personnel to be removed in the next couple of months. So that's the importance thereof. And then also continued non-compliance will lead to final deregistration, at which point other legal consequences actually steps in. The company or closed corporation will cease to exist as a registered business. It loses its perpetual existence and its limited liability. Now, what we mean by it loses its limited liability so if you are a registered company, class corporation, cooperative, you get something that's called a limited liability. The directors and shareholders, the people involved, is sort of protected against, against um, is protected in a sense that you can't sue them directly for actions. Unless, of course, there is was gross intent to defraud, for example, but you are pretty much, the national person are pretty much protected in this um, limited liability. So you sue the company and the, and the company itself will sue somebody else, for example, or hold somebody else liable for things that did not occur. So when final derision, that protective layer falls away and the directors and shareholders and whoever made decisions becomes directly liable to creditors and other, and other people, affected parties of their decisions. Then also, yes, directors can be held personally liable. The banks will freeze your bank account, for example. Um, you will not be able to access your funds in your bank accounts. If, then also your service provider may stop doing business with you because they have contracted to do business with a company. Now all of a sudden the company does not exist. And creditors may refuse to pay you because they are required to pay the company, but the company does not exist. So there are consequences to registration. So what's the consequence of non-compliance with beneficial ownership? So we will commence investigation against the company and issue compliance notices. The BO declaration is mand mandatory. Before filing AO, you will not be able to file annual returns and therefore will be finally deregistered. This is very important for the 1st of April 2024. So if you don't file your BO, you will not be able to file your annual returns and you'll become non-compliant with annual returns and you'll be deregistered for it. Also, it, again, it's a criminal offense to submit false or incorrect information to the CIPC. So again, how to file your annual returns. Um, this is the last slide. So please refer to the step-by-step -step guide. We are busy fine-tuning and finalizing it. Hopefully it will be published today or tomorrow. The step-by-step -step guide that will indicate how these two elements are doing. We also have, we are in the process of seeing whether we can do a quick video just to help clients um, how to file. We have realized and for example, I myself, I work visually. So a step-by-step -step guide is not always the best mechanism to show me or to guide me or to, to, to educate me on how to comply. Again, please go back to the webinars, the separate um, webinars on annual returns and beneficial ownership for more information on how these two services work so that you can familiarize yourself. And that is it. So I would like to thank you for your time um, in listening to this. I hope it helps you to understand what is coming, why it's there, and how to help you to comply easier and quicker with all of these requirements. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Krista. Um, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here. I, uh, I spoke with, with Shawnee, our facilitator for today. Um, I've, I've been tending to quite a few queries in, in the comments side. 
Um, I will, for your benefit, Krista, just go through some of these queries that is annual return related and um, a turnover declaration related that you can answer. If there's any BO related queries, then we can deal with those as well, if, if that's fine with you. No, that is perfect. Please go ahead. Thanks, Krista. Uh, the query from Amelia Brandt is, uh, or it looks more like a statement, annual return date equals recommending that this synchronize with the year-end date of the entity instead of the date of incorporation, better to have handled groups of entities. Okay. Um, over to you. Unfortunately, that is a policy decision, and that is not going to happen. Um, so I, I'm going to be upfront with it. It's a legal requirement and it was a policy decision to make it this way. The law has made and the regulations has made a way of accommodating this. Remember, there's a flow to all of these things, right? Financial year end happens. I'm going to take a February example. Companies financial year end was February 2023, right? Now, in terms of the Companies Act, They've got six months to prepare their financials, have it audited, those that need to be submitted to the uh, to the shareholders needs to be submitted for approval via the AGM. That takes about six months, right? So if you align annual returns, all of this is disaligned as well. So that has got six months to do. Then the law states that annual returns must be filed on the anniversary date, right? It gives, gives more legal assurance as to when things are going to happen and when they need to, need to happen. Especially for small businesses, it is easier to do. What the regulations makes provision for, it states when you file your annual returns and you file your financial information with it, you use the latest approved financials. So what does that mean? So I'm just going to quickly draw out my timeline, February, so plus six months, it's March, April, May, June, July, August. So financial year end is February 2023. It has got six months to prepare uh, financials, have it audited, submitted to the AGM if they need to have it submitted to the AGM. That brings them to the end of August. So now let's say the company's anniversary date is in June, right? June 2023 was its annual return period. Again, the regulation states the latest approved. So if this company was luckily enough, due to efficiency in its own business processes, was able to prepare the financial information, they will submit the financial information for February 2023. If they have not completed that process, because they're taking the six months or there are delays, then you'll use the financials for February 2022. So that has how the legislation is written. And that's, please don't, it's no use to put that on your wish list for the CIPC. It's not going to happen. Even under the, to align financial year end with annual return filing periods, etc. It's not even on the cards. We are now um, uh, going through a process of adding more things into the Companies Act. It's, it's not even on the list. So, And you can lobby for it in the next round of um, consideration when the Companies Act is amended again, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I'd rather be honest about it than creating unnecessary expectations that's probably not going to happen because of how our policy, uh, policy decisions regarding government is filtered into our legislation and our legislative processes. Thank you. Thanks, Krishna. Uh, Shavik asks, what exactly is meant by the validation of the turnover? So, let's say your turnover is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Where does that come out? That comes out to... Let's say 1.2 million, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven rand. That's what you submitted on your IXBRL when you filed your audited financial information. Okay. Now you need to file your annual return information. If you now put one, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine in it, the system is going to stop you and say, 
hold on. What you've submitted as your revenue, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on IXPRL, is not matching on what you're saying now on the annual return. And because you now said one, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's going to stop you. You have to go put in the value of the revenue as you place it onto X, onto IXPRL. So it's literally a value comparison. The two numbers, except now for the commas, must match 100% in order to complete the end or to get to the annual return filing. I hope that clarifies it. Thank you. Um, Testimonia wants to know from when will CIPC uh, be levying interest on the beneficial ownership registers not submitted? Um, I think this relates to both of us, Krista, is that the beneficial ownership declaration carries no fee. So there's no interest or penalties in terms of beneficial ownership if uh, monetary penalties. The problem now with the uh, annual return hard stop coming in is the fact that if you do not submit your beneficial ownership declarations as required, you won't be able to submit your annual return and therefore you um, will be uh, penalties will be levied in terms of your annual return requirements. If there's anything you want to add, Krista? So, no, so that is correct. And now that's why we indicate annual returns must be submitted ahead of time. I know there are intermediaries that has got many, many, many clients and they're trying to make it as easy as part of their planning cycle. But annual returns and everything that goes with annual returns, BO, compliance checklist, your financials, must be submitted ahead of time to make sure that if there is a challenge with what you submit or you're experiencing a challenge for whatever reason, that there's sufficient time to resolve it. So, so that's why we're imploring to ahead of time to make sure that you don't run the risk of filing your annual returns late and incurring penalties. There is no interest on annual returns. It is a penalty based on the turnover value uh, thresholds in order to um, in order to penalize late filing. So penalty is usually there in law to encourage us upfront compliance to change the behavior. I hope that helps. Thanks very much, Krista. Um, Cheryl asks, why is race one of the fields that have to be completed uh, in terms of beneficial ownership? I I assume um, Cheryl. Uh, the race field is there because of the international application of beneficial ownership. This is when um, risk analysis and uh, requirements for investigative purposes uh, is done on the beneficial ownership register that this information becomes relevant. But it is not a mandatory field as far as I as I know, um, and it's my register, so it's not information that must be completed. Thank you. Lucinda, I just want to add that, that everybody needs to realize is that it's fine to have overall information, but in order to drive change within an economy, to assess risk based on different categories, Demographics is becoming exceptionally important. And as the CIPC, as we start modernizing our systems, those that was, uh, yes, a very, uh, we'll have our anniversary of the enhanced e services next month, <laughs> tongue in cheek. Those that I filed during our enhanced e services in January would have realized that on a lot of those services, we were starting to ask demographic information. So we are going to bring that back because that is what government needs. We need an international standards. The World Bank asked us, literally, how many black directors do you have? How many directors are male? How many directors are female? Because it's not just a South African thing. It's an international thing whereby we're trying to shift um, shift in order for everybody to have equal access to the resources of this planet. So please be reminded that as systems are renewed, as CIPC, we are going to bring that in more and more onto our registry for natural persons. 
I hope that clarifies us the thinking as to why we're going to have demographics and that you need to stop preparing regarding demographic information to be submitted on, on most of our CIPC services. Thank you, Lucinda. Thanks, Krista. Uh, I see I'm just scrolling through this. Some of the queries that I did answer. If at any point, uh, neither, either myself or Krista did now not get to any of your queries, you're welcome to submit your um, query via the QRS or inquiry system on the CIPC website um, and selecting the correct category. I know that there's also a comment that queries on inquiries is not being answered. But you need to take into account the volumes of queries coming in in terms of these specific uh, divisions or sections and the, the people responsible for those. So the turnaround time on those queries is five to ten um, working days. So please be patient. We will get to all of you. But uh, you need to follow the correct procedure by lodging your queries. Uh, Melanie, there is a query that uh, she asked, uh, the one about, uh, from Hayley uh, was already answered, and then Melanie asked, what is the difference between affected and non-affected companies? As mentioned during uh, the presentation, it's very important for you to go and have a look at the user guide, which is uploaded on the CIPC website, which gives you a clear explanation of the different categories that you can select, Melanie. Uh, Michelle asks, what is a reasonable period to submit BO after submitting the AR? Will it also be 30 days? Michelle, uh, the legislation indicates that beneficial ownership declarations must be submitted within 30 days from uh, its anniversary date for pre-existing companies, which is in line with the annual return submission. And when that information changes, it must be submitted with the CIPC within 10 days from the date of the change. I also know that currently it's not uh, you're not able to file uh, amendments on the beneficial ownership register. This is due to the fact that um, that requirement is being built as we speak and the release is imminent. We will communicate widely once you are able to file your amendments. You will not be found to be non-compliant if the system doesn't allow you to submit these changes as yet. But uh, the uh, amendments and refilings process is uh, planned for release before the end of this year. And then all entities will be able to submit their uh, amendments as per the legislation. Let's have a look. Uh, can Bula, can the sole shareholder or representative sign the mandate? Uh, Bula, if it is a uh, resolution that is passed in terms of, uh, in the form of a resolution and not a, a letter or a power of attorney, then that can be done uh, by the shareholder, but we will still require the uh, directors of the company to sign the mandate as well. Please confirm if e-services will also have until the 1st of April 2024 to file the annual return option without first filing the BO register. Krista? That's correct. As I said, as I stated, every for now, it's just a reminder. It's like a soft, um, soft stop to remind you of the necessarily even on e-services, on the 1st of April, it will go into what we term as CIPC in our terminology as a hard stop, which say basically means on all channels, you will have to have complied with a preceding service in order to get to the annual returns. Thank I hope you. that clarifies it. Uh, Pollen Kuna wants to know, how long do you take before you deregister a company for not filing returns? It, it depends. Um, um, if you don't mind, that is also stated in the previous webinars on annual returns. In the past, it was the way that we did it. it. We had to go through the South African Post Office because of registered mail. And then we had like limitations on costing because it's a government department. We are only authorized as we need to spend what we plan on spending. And, and there's a lot of red tape regarding it. But as per next uh January, February, March, we are going to automate that process even more. So hopefully, as from um, from next year, 
we'll streamline the system in such a way that if you are non-compliant within your two, uh, uh, two years, you immediately go into your deregistration process and about four months in order to get final deregistered. So that's what we're aiming. There has, as for the current batch of matters that are we are preparing for final deregistration, again, please refer to the other webinars. It's got more detail on this. The date is we are going to final deregister around about the 19th of January. We are aiming to deregister anything between 1.7 and 1.8 million companies and closed corporations for non-compliance with annual returns. So if you are here and you know your annual return is outstanding, please file ASAP um, because we are going to deregister for non-compliance uh, mid-January 2024 for non-compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Krista. Uh, Veronica wants to know if uh, AFSs must be filed, must it be filed with the annual return or can it still be filed separately? You can file the AFS separately. It has also got a standalone option to it, but it has to be a submitted before you can actually file the annual return. Thank you. Amelia wants to know if incorrect annual return turnover value was captured per the AR filing screen. How can this be corrected? Please log a ticket on the QRA system. You need to provide a whole bunch of paperwork. You need to prepare, have the financials. You need to submit now to us the actual PDFs uh, with a letter as to why the error occurred, uh, giving us instruction to, to debit or credit the account. So you need to log a ticket for the annual return unit. They will indicate to you what you need, and then they will prepare the documentation that goes through credit and debit notes. And the reason why they take so long is because they run through two departments and about five signatories. That's a lot in order to get to our finance department in order to process. So please log a ticket um, with your financials for the relevant period, instruction letter, your certificate that we can identify which filing was incorrect, and then the AR team will prepare the necessary documents for our finance department, and then we'll kickstart the secondary process. Thank you, Krista. Uh, I, I see we have a few comments uh, from um, Leon and Ozias and AKI10, just saying thank you for the, for the webinar and the presentation. Much appreciated. Um, Stuart wants to know if there is a template for a basic securities or members register. Um, yes, Stuart, go and have a look again at the user guide as well as the webinars on beneficial ownership information. It, the minimum information that must be contained in your securities and beneficial interest register and your mandate is, is indicated in those presentations in terms of the BO webinar. So you'll get all the information there. Um, let's just see, uh, recording be made available, everything will be published. On the, on our CIPC YouTube channel, please, and also all webinars are published on our main website, www.cipc.co.za under webinars. But please follow us on YouTube and our social media platforms because we issue a lot of invitations and information on those platforms to help you with your compliance and to keep in the know what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Janine Robbie wants to know if there's any exceptions on submitting annual financial statements with your AOR. Legally, no. <laughs> That, that's the perfect answer. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, so legally, there is no. Um, you will have to go to the tribunal, companies tribunal, and ask for an uh, administrative exception. Uh, they, they're the only ones that can actually do it. Uh, they, I have not really seen them giving um, exceptions for that. But we as CIPS do understand that's, that real life and business does happen. So if you are running late and there are problems, rather log a ticket. It's under companies and closed corporations, and then you choose financial statements or IXBRL. And then you just say, say your situation that we just know what's going on. 
Uh, IFSs and FAS are administered by a different section within the CIPC, but from my experience, yes, we are the regulator, but we do understand that there's a real world out there. So you're more than welcome to contact them and then see what advice they may have on the situation for you. But as a general rule, only exceptions in law. If the Companies Act doesn't make provision for something, um, the Companies Tribunal may consider it under, I think it's Section 6, for an administrative order. But you'll have to go through the Companies Tribunal. Thank you. Thanks very much, Krista. Um, I've, I've come to the end of the, the comments list uh, on the queries posted. Some of them have not been answered, uh, but they seem to be procedural queries that uh, if A happened, what do I do, etc. So you just need to submit to the relevant division, as I've already indicated, for, for resolution of your procedural or operational queries. Um, from my side, thank you very much for your time and attention. All of this information, this excellent presentation by Krista um, and the, the audio is uh, of the webinar is available on the CIPC website. So you can go and have a look at this as well as previous webinars if you still are unclear on any on anything further. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, that's it from me. Thanks, Krista. Um, once again, thank you very much. Sorry, Lucinda, you also have to take a bow on this. This is a collective process. It's not <laughs> It's not one or the other. It's a combined effort. So I want to uh, just express my thanks to Lucinda for her input into this and for uh, taking us through the registry and doing the Q&A for us. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for taking the effort and time to actually attend this webinar to find out more. That's the first step of complying is find out more before you actually comply. So thank you very much from the CIPC. Thanks very much, Krista. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, this session is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.